to open with a few introductory remarks. We're going to take a part of Isaiah 28. We're going to take verses 9 through 22, which are a whole story in themselves, although the entire chapter is very much related and deserves a lot of study and consideration, but it will fit with the message that we see in verses 9 through 22. These verses are a remarkable description of the onset of the harvest back in Brother Russell's day. And they are going to detail, uh, very much detail the concept of sight for the brethren versus blindness for Babylon. And as I mentioned, you can expand in both directions. We've got eight verses before this and a number of verses after it. And it's all one story, all well worth your attention. But I'll tell you where this came from. We are all familiar with at least three verses, if not more in this chapter, because we studied them isolatedly. I'm sure if you've been through volume five, you have come across uh, several of these verses because they occur in the discussion of what death is or what hell is and so on. But uh, obviously Brother Russell is making a point about death or about hell. And so he doesn't have time to explain the whole chapter. So that's left to us. And for many, many years, all I knew about was these isolated verses. And uh, in our study, we had one brother read the whole context. And as he read it, it, it's like the scales were peeled off of our eyes and we realized what a wonderful contextual setting these verses have. So let's look at three of them. They're on the outline in front of you. Uh, 10, 15, and 16. These are verses that you know. Verse 10 I recall it says, uh, line upon line, line upon, uh, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, a little here and a little there. Uh, actually, when we get down to verse 13, it repeats it and then it adds an ominous line that they may go and stumble backward, be broken, snared and taken captive. So there's something about this line upon line and precept upon precept that's not good for somebody. And we'll see that in the context. Um, we might notice at this point that there is what we might even call an irritating repetition. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. Now, when the Bible does something strange, we probably ought to stop and think about it. And uh, usually, this is certainly true in the New Testament, but I think it is in the Old also. A double repetition suggests that something's not complete. A triple repetition means it's complete. For instance, just... As an example, out of the book of Revelation, we've got, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's because that's complete. There won't be more than three of them. We've got holy, holy, holy. And that's because it's complete. There won't be more than three of them. But you've got Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's not complete. There's more to follow. And so I think here what happens with this irritating repetition is it is saying, you've got to keep this up. It's not a one-time thing. You've got to be doing this for most of your Christian life. Although you might notice in verse 10 that when it ends, it doesn't do a repetition. It does a little here, a little there. And the very fact that it's not repetitious at that point seems to be suggesting that when we do 
the repetition, precept upon precept, line upon line, we will eventually glue it together into a unified whole. And that is what has happened in the harvest period for us. We have learned to study a little here and a little there coming up with the whole divine plan of the ages. But we had to do it precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Okay, verse 15, you've also heard. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have made a pact. And it continues. Brother Russell goes into those because he talks about what death is. And he talks about what Sheol is. And as we get into the context of this, I think it will have a far greater meaning than just defining what death and what Sheol happen to be. Verse 16, therefore thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. New Testament quotes this, by the way. And we are going to see again how it fits into the context is a very wonderful verse. But I am sure we also see the great pyramid reference, which corresponds in a great deal to Job 38, 6, and 7. And it does so for a reason, and we will see the reason as we examine the context. So, in summary here for our introduction, we know these verses, but maybe we don't know, <coughs> pardon me, their contextual unity. As a prelude to our detailed look at each verse, it might be wise to summarize what we think this whole passage is about. It seems to be a simple overview of how the Lord addresses Babylon as the harvest period begins. It attempts to inform those who will be abandoned by the Lord as to why they will be abandoned. It lets them know that things of the Lord don't really interest them. It also lets them know that their self-deceptions are far more attractive in their eyes than the word of the Lord. It also explains how the Lord will, as the harvest work begins, deal with those who truly love him and respect his teachings versus the majority of Christendom. <clears throat> it explains clearly the foundation truth, the ransom, as well as the foundation error, death, And finally, it will give evidence as to how the erroneous system will be devoured. That is what we are going to be looking at. So let's see, I can't raise this outline on the screen. So whomever is taking charge of it, let's go to verse by verse outline and let's take the verses one at a time. I know the first verse shown there is verse nine. I wanna make reference first to verse eight, just to show the transition from the first eight verses. They scourge Babylon. They are a real condemnation. But that section ends with verse eight. For all the tables are full of filthy vomit without a single clean place. This is going to introduce us into the verses we're looking at. Now, a table, of course, is a place you eat. Apparently, there is nothing on this table that you would want to eat. But here again, if we examine words, we can get a little extra understanding. Vomit is regurgitated food. 
And this is the habit that Babylon was in. They have kept over the centuries regurgitating the same old, unpalatable, unreasonable stuff. And on their table where you're supposed to eat, there's not a clean spot. So this is the Lord's summary of the status of Christendom just as the harvest is about to begin. Verse nine, four questions. To whom would he teach knowledge? And to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk? Those just taken from the breast? So this whole section starts with questions. If you're upset with Babylon, who's he going to give the truth that is due to? First of all, the first two questions kind of go together. To whom would he teach knowledge and to whom would he interpret the message? So knowledge, of course, is just information. We have to be careful that we're not, that we're not just pleased with the information. But the second question, to whom would he interpret the message, is who will get understanding? Not just the information, but down at the cellular level, the application of that information. It's not understanding. That's the first question. The second question is its effect upon us. And then there are two rhetorical questions that end the verse. Basically, God is saying, uh, am I going to give it to those just weaned from milk? In other words, am I going to give it to somebody who doesn't have any taste for meat? I think rhetorical question means you know the answer. He won't. And the second question, those just taken from the breast? And again, it's a rhetorical question. Is he going to give it to those with no experience in chewing? And the answer is no, he won't. So by this verse, we see the questions about who is going to get meat in due season as we enter the harvest period. So starting with verse 10, he announces a new standard. For he says, precept on precept, precept on precept, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. This, by the way, was Brother Russell's logical presentation of the meat that was due in the harvest season. He said, look at the context, will you? Do exhaustive topical studies, will you? Do dispensational studies, will you? Consider the symbolic versus the literal, will you? Sounds like a lot of work. But that was the point of verse nine. Who is God going to give it to? He's going to give it to somebody who is willing to do this work. Now, I think the precept upon precept is a reference to exhaustive topical study. We keep adding the precepts that come from this scripture and that one until we come to a conclusion. The line upon line is probably chronological truths. We take this line from the book of Kings and this line from the book of Daniel, this line from Revelation, and we come up with conclusions. But we've got to do it that way. We can't just rely on a single scripture. So the verse ends a little here, a little there, and we have accumulated from here and there to the point where we have the truth as a body of information. So that's the new standard in how you study. Babylon 
Never did that. Or rarely did it, let's put it that way. Verse 11 shows that the spokesmen have changed. Indeed, he will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. Now you've got strange spokesmen. They are not seminary educated. To the old theological world, these are foreign tongues. You know that. If you witness to somebody out there who is steeped in Babylonish tradition, you might as well be saying blah, 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 because that's all they hear. It's a foreign tongue. You might as well be speaking Klingon. They don't get it. He is speaking when he is seeking his own with what seems to those who can't hear a foreign tongue. All right. Now, as we get to verse 12, the Lord is going to say to the ones he's rejecting, you must realize you had an opportunity, but you wouldn't listen. And therefore, I know you won't listen. Verse 12. He who said to them, here is rest. Give rest to the weary. That was the gospel message for the whole age. And here is repose. Enter into my rest, God says in Hebrews. But they would not listen. He's giving the reason for their rejection. He had offered them these good things, and he said, you didn't want them. Verse 13. So the word of the Lord to them will be, Precept on precept, precept on precept, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there, that they may go and stumble backwards, be broken, snared, and taken captive. In other words, they are so opposed to this kind of examination of Scripture that all it's going to do to them is make them stumble and fall backward. What to us has become a blessing, to them has become a curse. And the Lord is simply saying in verse 13, my offer doesn't change. My rejection doesn't change. Logic is going to cause captivity for the illogical. And Babylon is illogical. All right. Now if we can go up on the outline to the next section. New truth will drown old lies. Let's take 14 and 15 as a unit. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers, who rule his people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have made a pact, the overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by, for we have made falsehood our refuge and have concealed ourselves with deception. Wow. First thing we notice is they don't get it. They think what they have in their hands is enough to protect them from whatever comes their way. So verse 14 is basically telling us that the leaders, the old leadership is condemned. Verse 15 starts to go into the root of their problem. And there are two primary roots of their problem. The first one is death isn't death. And that is just about the teaching, not only of Christendom, but almost every religion in the world. Death isn't death. And the Lord says, that's where it hurts, doesn't it? That's the root of your entire problem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death. That's what holds people in check. They're explaining that death isn't death, the very first lie from Satan. 
And then they say, we will continue distorting the word hell. It's our pact with success in holding the people in check. We, uh, what does it say here? With Sheol, we have made a pact. So they not only have based their entire religion on the primary lie that death is not death, but then they say, oh, and we love to enforce it with this stupid threat that you're going to be in eternal torment if you don't listen to us. The Lord says, that's where it hurts, doesn't it? That's the basis of everything that is wrong with you. And then they say, because of this, the overwhelming scourge, by the way, the margin says flood, and that will become important here. It's talking about loads of truth coming upon the face of the earth. Therefore, the overwhelming scourge won't reach us when it passes by, for we have made falsehood our refuge and have concealed ourselves with deception. Wow. Sounds like Adolf Hitler. You remember, basically, I may not be quoting him verbatim, but basically he said, there's nothing so powerful as a good lie which is repeated a million times. And that's the basis of Babylon's problem. They think there is nothing so powerful as a good lie which is repeated a million times. And they're relying on that. However, and I don't really like signs on my walls, but I have this little plaque that says there is nothing so powerful as the truth. So this overwhelming scourge, flood of truth on the face of the earth will overflow their hiding place. All right, now that the Lord told them what the problem was, he is kind enough to tell them what the remedy is. Verse 16, therefore says the Lord God, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. The last phrase first, this is an unshakable foundation. No flood's going to wash you off of it. And this costly cornerstone for the foundation is the ransom. He showed that their error was death is not death. He says, here's the truth, the ransom. This is the offsetting truth. The thing that becomes the foundation doctrine of the entire harvest period. And he relates it, and I'm not going to go to Job because I'll probably run out of time, but Job 38, 6, and 7, when you get time, this seems to be a reference to the Great Pyramid, which is the whole divine plan of the ages, set in stone where nobody can move it. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone. And of course, Jesus is the stone upon which the church is built, the rock, a tested stone a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. The ransom is the firmest of all doctrines for understanding what God is doing. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. By the way, Jesus made a little prophecy which you might appreciate. Uh, basically when the Pharisees condemned the crowds for referring to Jesus as Messiah. And you have to read this carefully, and I'm not going to go to the text to do it, but he's making a prophecy about our day. He's saying basically when his disciples can't speak anymore, when they're unable to speak, the stones will cry out. In other words, the Lord has as a witness in the land of Egypt, this witness in stone, which has in it the chronology and the entire divine plan placed there. So when there are no brethren here to teach, there will be this pile of stone that will. Okay, now we go to the next section, one verse long. 
Oh, I already did that, didn't I? 16, okay. Uh, how and why you will fail. He has shown them their error, death. He has shown them the remedy, the ransom. And now he is going to tell them how they will fail and why they will fail. Verse 17, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the level. Then hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the secret place. This is not the peaceable kingdom here. This is our day. This is the harvest time. There will be an increased worldwide cry for justice and righteousness. Have you heard that recently? That's part of all the commotion going on everywhere. They're not getting it yet, but they are crying for it, for justice and righteousness. And the hail, the hard truths, the social truths, this is not they're going to sit down and read volume one. These are the truths that humanity itself is now trying to proclaim and seek. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the water shall overflow the secret place. Verse 18. And your covenant with death shall be canceled and your pact with Sheol shall not stand when the overwhelming scourge or flood passes through. Then you become its trampling place. Wow. Wow. Sounds a little bit like Revelation 14 with the grapes being trampled out. The vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. <clears throat> so verse 18 is saying, consequently, when all these truths, mostly social, come, your old covenants and pacts will dissolve and people will trample on your claims. It's happening now. Societal truths, not biblical doctrine, is sweeping away the refuge of lies. 19. As often as it passes through, it will seize you. For morning after morning, it will pass through any time during the day or night, and it will be sheer terror to understand what it means. <laughs> you want to understand the news? Here you go. First of all, it says that truth is going to come in increasing waves as oft as it passes through. This is not a one-time event. This is a series of tidal waves. As oft as it passes through, it will seize you. I think the world realizes it keeps getting seized. You know, one problem passes and they think, oh, okay, we can go back to normal. They're even saying that now after COVID, but we could go back then to normal. No, there will be more waves. The Lord's plan has increasing waves in severity and in frequency. You will experience only terror as you can't understand the social message. That's what's happening. That's your news every night. Terror, and it will get worse. Just a little aside here. Jesus quotes from Daniel in Matthew 24. And he points out that it will get to the point where there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So bad that if it weren't cut short, no flesh would be saved. Brethren, this may seem rather obvious, but maybe not. Sometimes I hear brethren talking and it doesn't seem to have become obvious to them. It's going to get that way. The trouble is going to be so bad that no flesh will be saved. If you think this is a problem out your window, just wait. Daniel and Jesus keep telling us 
It will be trouble such has never been so much that it would destroy everything. We're not there yet. Please believe it. Okay. I think we are at verse 20. The Lord's kind of going to mock them now. And it's a well-placed verse because as I said, one wave passed and the world says, oh, we're back to normal again. We'll rebuild our economy. We'll do blah, 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 blah. Yes, well, that's not what the Lord has in mind. And he mocks them. The bed is too short on which to stretch out. And the blanket is too small to wrap oneself in. The Lord is saying, uh, um, can't seem to stretch out comfortably anymore, can you? The Lord is saying, uh, you can't quite cover your vulnerabilities, can you? It's a very powerful verse. The Lord is mocking them because they honestly think they can fix things. And he's saying, no, it's not going to work. <clears throat> now, this brings us to verse 21, where the Lord mentions Perizim and Gibeon, Old Testament occurrences. But what he's doing here is saying, this is typical. Verse 21. For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim. He will be stirred up as in the Valley of Gibeon to do his task, his unusual task, and to work his work, his extraordinary work. Well, Let's go there. The lessons from Perizim and Gibeon. These are recorded both in 2 Samuel and in 1 Chronicles. I'm going to look with you only at the uh, Samuel one. You'll want later to look at the Chronicles one. But let's see what happened. Because the Lord has just told us that this is typical of what he's going to be doing now. Very important prophecy. Uh, on your handout there, it says 20 to 25. I'm going to start with verse 17, if you don't mind. <clears throat> when the Philistines heard, Philistines here represent the enemy of the Lord. When the Philistines heard that they anointed David, and David, of course, is our Lord before the kingdom when he becomes Solomon. They had anointed David king over Israel and the Philistines went up to seek out David. And when David heard of it, he went down to the stronghold. Okay, the enemies here hear that David is now king. Please remember that Brother Russell announced that. He pulled together all the ministers in Pittsburgh and he said, the Lord is king. The Lord has returned. Here's my evidences. You know how far he got. Nowhere. Verse 18. Now the Philistines came and spread themselves out in the valley of Rephaim. In other words, Christianity said to Brother Russell, and therefore to the Lord, uh, we can't put up with such nonsense. We, the ministers of Pittsburgh, reject it out of hand. And they go out to challenge the king. Christianity has challenged the truth consistently ever since that point. And they spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Now, we might miss something here. This also comes out of the fifth volume study on hell. But in Isaiah 14, and you need a margin for it, verse 9 and this is talking about the period that we are talking about the time that Satan is being bound Sheol from beneath is excited over to meet you over you to meet you when you come 
<laughs> Sheol, of course, being oblivion. Oblivion really wants to take in these evil forces. Uh, 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 it arouses for you the spirits of the dead, all the leaders of the earth. It raises all the kings of the nations from their thrones. What I want to point out in verse 9 is that the word spirits in the margin says or shades, but then it says Hebrew, Rephaim. And we've got that in our prophecy. And I'm going to go back there to our prophecy in 2 Samuel. Because the Philistines came, verse 18, and spread themselves out in the valley of Rephaim. This is the valley of the shadow of death for the old order. That's what it means in Isaiah 9, excuse me, Isaiah 14, about Rephaim. That's what it means here. This is the beginning of their end. Okay, verses 19 and 20. Then David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go up against the Philistines? Wilt thou give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. So David came to Baal Perazim and defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like the breakthrough of waters. Therefore, he named the place Baal Perazim, master of the breakthrough. Jesus is the master of the breakthrough of the waters. You remember that from our Isaiah 28. This is a flood of waters. But sounds like it could end there, doesn't it? But it doesn't. This is part of the waves of attack on Babylon. I think this represents 1914, when David takes them head on. And the Lord broke through and was Lord of the breakthrough. Verse 21, and they abandoned their idols there. So David and his men carried them away. I think their idols were church state primarily. And that's gone. Those idols were abandoned there. Verse 22. Now, the Philistines came up once again and spread themselves out in the valley of Rephaim. <laughs> they never learn. But this is the point that we learned in Isaiah 28. There are going to be waves to wash them away before these shades <clears throat> of the valley of the shadow of their death are successful. So this is referring to something post-1914, and I think it's referring to the whole rest of the harvest period. <clears throat> Verse 23, and when David inquired of the Lord, he said, you shall not go directly up, circle around behind them and come at them in front of the balsam trees. I'll read 24 also. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then you shall act promptly, for then the Lord will have gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. In other words, 1914 was a direct attack. Everything else here is from behind the bushes. But the Lord is preparing the way, and eventually, David, our Lord, along with the risen saints, will be successful in this valley of Rephaim to put a total end to the old order. <clears throat> this victory will be by stealth. He says, go hide behind the bushes. God will have done the preliminary work. Verse 25. Then David did so, just as the Lord had commanded him, and struck down the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. Okay. Gibeon means high, swelled, humpbacked, or hill. This shows that when this whole picture started, the Philistines, the enemies, were in power. 
They were high and exalted. To Giza, which means to cut or divide. So from the height, Gibeon, to Giza, where they are cut down, the Lord has destroyed the whole order. I love the final words in Chronicles. I won't turn there, but it says, then the fame of David went out out into all lands and the Lord brought the fear of him on all the nations. Isn't that wonderful? The perfect conclusion to the story. Back to Isaiah 28. The Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim and he will be stirred up as in the valley of Gibeon to do his task, his unusual task. What's so unusual? You know, you almost don't have to think because it's obvious in a sense. Here is Christianity. It's named after his son. It has been the dominant religion in the world for 2,000 years. What could be stranger than God would say, that's not mine. I'm destroying it. His unusual task. And to work his work, his extraordinary work his alien work. If you go out there and tell your neighbor Christianity is going to be destroyed, their response will be something like, and what university you come from? That's how unusual this work is. But you know about it because of precept upon precept and line upon line here or there little. You've got it, they don't. All right. Verse 22, and now do not carry on as scoffers. This is, this is a little wisdom to somebody who might still be in Babylon. Lest your fetters be made stronger. What's that remind you of? That's the binding of the tares. They've already got fetters on them, but if they keep not listening, the fetters are getting tighter and tighter and they are more and more bound in their errors and in their haughtiness and in everything that will bring them down. Lest your fetters be made stronger. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts. I love that. I don't know. You know, sometimes the commentators will tell you Lord of hosts means Lord of armies. That's okay. But hosts is the people, the masses of people. God is fighting for the masses. And that's why he's doing what he's doing. I have heard from the Lord God of hosts of decisive destruction on all the earth. The Lord's worldwide destruction is decisive. Lord bless you. I hope this pulls those loose ends that you have studied for years into a nice cohesive whole. It's very faith strengthening. May the Lord add his blessing.